what's like your strategy for when you, like how you start a new company? It starts with the team. The first thing for the companies that has always been, who are the people I want to do this with? Solve a problem that you have. Cause I always say like, if you have a problem, there's probably a million other people at least that have that problem. Yeah, it, it's a cheat code, right? Why is it your final startup? I think we have all the elements. We have an amazing team. The business is well capitalized. It has great traction. And as we just talked about, the like scope of the vision is so large. Oh, what's seem? Hello, how are you doing, my friend? I'm good, how are you? Doing good, doing good. Man, like the first question that I have, and we just get into it. I sure. hope you don't mind. Let's do I it. I like to make it conversational and just like like people can kind of like feel us meeting for the first time too. And so um, I think that the big burning question that I have for you initially, which I'm, I'm sure people, I might ask you this a lot. I listened to a couple podcasts before this with you on it is, Man, everything you seem to build turns to gold, right? So far. <laughs> and I'm sure, yeah, so far, so far. Um, what, what's like your strategy for when you, like how you start a new company? Like, do you have some sort of like mental framework or decision process? Are you just like as simple as, hey, this is a need in the market that we've found and let's do it kind of thing? Like, what's that look like? Yeah. Um, to answer yeah. your question, look, I mean, it's really about like, it starts with the team. The first thing for the companies that has always been, who are the people I want to do this with? Because that's mm-hmm. really what your company's experience is. Like from a day-to-day perspective, your company's experience is you're spending a bunch of time with these people trying to make this thing happen. Mm-hmm. So you have to mm-hmm. feel like you have high conviction in the team, the team's capability, that you want to spend time with the team, that you're excited to spend time with the team. So for me, it has always been about the team first and foremost. And actually when we started our second startup and our third startup, it was the same founding team essentially. Mm -hmm. And it always started with the team. We like got together. We said, okay, we want to do another startup together. What is it going to be? Like the team was the constant. The team was the first thing we kind of dialed in on. Mm, You guys knew you could mesh and work together. And yeah, totally. Uh, After that, I think the things we look for are like big market size, like is the opportunity really, really large. And the benefit of the market size being large is it just gives you a little bit more leeway. Yeah. Like, you know, if your market is small and you have to capture a huge percentage to make it work, it's very sensitive to kind of those initial assumptions. If the market size is large or growing and expects to be large pretty soon, you just have a little bit more breathing room to figure things out. Maybe your initial thing was not exactly right, but like a slight adjustment to it would still land on something that's big. So I'd say market size is a big factor. Um, And the third is really just trying to very anecdotally validate the need, meaning let's go and talk to, we have some hypothesis about who we think the potential customers are. Let's go and talk Mm -hmm. to some of them. And let's see, is this really a hair on fire problem for them? Is this really like in their top three? And if it's not, then it's probably, I'm not saying it's a bad business, but it's not a business that I like to do. I like to do things Mm -hmm. where just like the pain is so glaringly obvious for someone that it is in their top three. And it's like, cool, if we could solve this for you, like, would that make your life better? And they're like, oh my God, yes. Like, where do I sign? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. on one podcast I was listening to you in the past, you were saying that you almost these pains are pains that you had in your own businesses since the, since when you started building businesses, right? And which, excuse me, I thought was interesting because I have this framework of like, um, I, I've thought about this and started a couple, not as successful as yours yet. Yes, yes. This next one though, it, it's going to happen. What's name? It's going to happen. Uh, <laughs> so with that, I think there's like, okay, solve a problem that you have. Cause I always say like, if you have a problem, there's probably a million other people at least that have that problem. Yeah. It, it's a cheat code, right? It, it, I yeah. don't think you have to do it, but it makes your life a lot easier because the first thing you're trying to do is to figure out who am I targeting and what should I build? And like, if you have the problem and there are lots of people like you, that's kind of like a built-in initial market that you know a ton about. It's like free customer discovery work that you don't otherwise have to do. So I, I don't think it's a requirement, but it makes life a lot easier. Yeah, 100%. And for me, I feel like it keeps you one, it's more, it's like empathetic building because you kind of like, Ooh, that could be like a book title or something, but like, it's like empathetic, you know, entrepreneurship or whatever. So you're like building for yourself. And then two, I think it keeps you motivated because you're like, I freaking, you have conviction that it's like, yes, I know this is a problem because, Hey, I had the problem. And I think a lot of people, buddies that I have today, um, you know, you know that, that maybe haven't built anything in the past and stuff, and they, they build like a solution and look for a problem versus like, look for a problem, build a solution. 
right? And so I, I see that happen time and time again. And like, you, you seem to avoid that, <laughs> which is pretty awesome at all costs. And so, so yeah, my, my question for you is when you're, you experience your own problems, there's probably for me, even right now in building a new company, I'm like, oh my God, there's like 10 problems here that like, I, I wish there was a better solution for, you know, as you're building, you get those ideas. How did you decide which one to pick? Right. Was it like, do you get the team together and do you say, Hey, let's vote on what we should do? Or, you know, cause you, you have the team in place or was it like, Hey, we all agree. This is the most pressing thing that most businesses in the biggest market size opportunity. It, it's definitely closer to the second one, meaning yeah. that you're never going to have perfect information in starting. And so if your bar is, I've done some super rigorous analysis and I made all the charts and graphs and the numbers imply that XYZ is the right business. Like that's not going to happen. All of your business ideas are going to seem bad because anything in the early days, it's like, well, maybe this is a good idea or maybe it's just a bad idea and that's why it doesn't already exist. Like you basically, you and your co-founders have to kind of get together and say, well, look, we don't know, but we're kind of leaning this one. Let's give it a shot. So I don't think there is a perfect mechanism or system for with super high conviction determining which one is the best one there's a certain amount of you just have to it's like an exercise of the head and the heart you just have to kind of like be into it i think yeah <laughs> i get i get and what got i get what got us this conversation which is fun is um i actually became a pilot customer for distribute right and you personally emailed me and you actually said hey i am this is actually me Wasim, I am emailing you. Just want to say thank you. And I was like, oh. And and when, after you emailed me, I actually emailed you back. And I was like, I was like, is this really you? I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna test this. You know, I'm gonna test this and be like, is this really Wasim? And you respond, I'm like, okay, this is really Wasim. This is awesome. Um, and so I'm like, one, either Wasim is like really on top of this whole founder led sales thing and like really like in the weeds, or two they're not adding a lot of customers. So I think it's one. <laughs> it is number one. I send a lot of these emails. It's, I mean, yeah. look, the, the thing that's funny, you, you have me on a little tangent about this now too, which is like, look, yeah. my background, I said computer science at MIT. I was an engineer by training. Like in our first company, we were like, oh, we just need to like build the product and like that will like solve all our problems. And we learned kind of very yeah. viscerally, like, no, it kind of doesn't, like the product needs to be good, but the product being yeah. good is not sufficient to get it out into the market. You have to really make the case to people about why it's good and why they should be using you. And I think one of the secret weapons that any founder has is you just like care a lot. Like you care more than most mm -hmm. people care about the things they do because you're the founder, right? You're like one of the founders of the company. You started the thing. And I think if you can like channel that care into things that make the customer experience like really good or differentiated or feel like honestly not scalable, like that's very powerful. Like, look, we, we have literally thousands of customers. So we do yeah. add like a bunch in a given day, in a given week, in a given month. But yeah. it is not so many that it's intractable for me to look at the list of them and send them email. And so I do. And at some point that won't be possible. At some point, like, no, it will, it will yeah. not be realistic that I do it. But like most people wouldn't because they think like, oh, it's not scalable, da, da, da. But it's like, actually, it doesn't matter if it's scalable. What matters is you can do it now. And I think it really helps. Like, I think it's, it's a valuable signal to the customer that like, look, we care. We're going to like do our darndest to like really make it work, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And in, in it does come across that you care. Right. And that, and it's so, it's something so simple too. And like some people that I, you know, is it like the, they think they can't do it. Is it, it's like, do you care or are you just lazy? You know, like, do you just not want to do it? Like in a tangent now you got me on is you were an engineer and you went into sales. Cause that's my story. Right. I studied electrical engineering. Um, I was an electrical engineer, did like power systems and electronics engineering hardware. So yeah, yeah. if anyone listening, don't do hardware is insane. Like go do, go do CS, um, <laughs> skip the hardware. No, we, we actually need hardware people, but, um, did that. And then I went into sales. So I was early at outreach. Right. And I started more on the technical side. And then I, I, I ended my career at outreach and enterprise sales. 
And um, what actually made me want to do that, and this is so like Silicon Valley tech of me, right? But it's like that one Naval quote, which was like, learn to build, learn to sell. If you can do both, like you'll be unstoppable. And so I was like, shoot, yeah, like I've always been a builder. I'm, I'm pretty okay, above average at building things, I would assume. But like there's what's, it, it doesn't matter. Like at the end of the day, like how good your product is, because if no one knows what it is, it's, it's not, especially, and it's getting harder and harder and harder and harder. Right. And so that is what propelled me to really do that. Um, and kind of like do the sales thing. Right. And like learn it at like the, you know, the master's level of like doing it for outreach at a sales company, selling to sales people doing that whole thing. Um, and I wouldn't trade it for anything. Right. Like I would, I would never, um, go back to being, no, I just want to do engineering or product stuff totally. or whatever. Yeah. And now could I have been a, like an A plus star engineer if I stayed in, in that side of the world? Maybe, but I'm also thinking like, and I want to get your thoughts on this. Is it better to be a generalist or is it better to be like super hardcore in one area? It's a good question. It's a good question. And I think it really depends yeah. because like as a founder, you kind of do need to do a little bit of everything. And so in that sense, mm -hmm. like, Mm -hmm. Being a generalist is more useful. I th look, I think there are two options. Option one is, let's say, just kind of classic structure. You have two founders, right? One mm -hmm. is the builder and one is the seller. And they're actually like you would rather the builder like be spiky at building and like have amazing chops on building. And you'd rather the seller like be an all-star yeah. seller. Mm -hmm. uh, that, I guess, is an argument in favor of specialization. The argument in favor of being a generalist is like, look, for the VC-backed high-growth startup, your main lever for getting things done, hopefully, is not you literally do it all yourself. It's hopefully you like find and hire and attract and retain good people, people that are amazing at what they do in each of those disciplines, and they do it. Yeah. And so that actually is an argument in favor of being a generalist, which is like if you can talk to the sales reps and you can talk to the engineers like that's very powerful because yeah. like you now, like you are, you're credible in both worlds. Whereas yeah. I think if you just, you're like, look, all I've done is engineering forever. I don't know anything about sales. I might not even respect sales. I might think that like sales is icky or bad or not valuable or not hard or whatever. Like <laughs> that's going to be a problem. Like yeah. that's definitely going to be a problem. You have to kind of like get and appreciate and value what the function does to be able to successfully get good people to do it with you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and with that, like, so obviously you're, you're big on founder led sales. Like how did you break through on that? Were you just like, I care so much that I'm just going to freaking do sales for the, for or my companies or were, were like, did you read all the sales books? Like how'd you get started with seeing and, and was it scary? I'm sure you were scared. You were like, what the hell am I doing here? Right. It, it wasn't totally like easy. Yeah. Um, honestly, a little bit of all of the above, which is to say, <laughs> okay. so in the first company, the first company we started, we started right out of school. It was four of us. We were all engineers by training and we, it was very clear to us in the early days. Okay. We need to like split up. Like we're not all going to be able to write the code. Like yeah. some of us will need to like do sales and marketing and product. And some of us will need to like write the code. Like who's going to do what? And I like liked writing the code. I like quite enjoyed being an engineer, but I was like, well, I kind of like talking to people too. And like the good news <laughs> yeah. is it was a highly technical product. We had technology that could update running Linux systems without rebooting. We would go and basically like live patch the kernel. And so we were selling okay. to like IT admins and developers and like Linux nerds basically. And so yeah. actually it was a nice like, like entry point into the world of sales because what you were doing and this is i think like when sales is done well this is what you're doing you're basically like understanding what problem they have yeah. and you're thinking about well does my thing solve this problem and if so like let me explain to you why like it is super consultative mm -hmm. and i think that was helpful to me that was like really easing my way into it because it, it's not like we were selling a commodity thing and I was just trying to get you to pay as much as you possibly could for it. It was like, we had this technology. I thought it was cool. We were proud of it. We thought it really solved the problem you had. Like I wanted you to use it. And I like, well, we would like geek out together basically. Yeah. And so my entry point into the world of sales was actually not like, oh, I have a quota. Let me sell you these things. It's, we have a thing. We're excited about it. We're excited to like see you use it because we think it'll help you. Like as one fellow nerd to another, like, let me get you on board on it. And yeah, I think that yeah. sort of led me to like 
probably I could have like learned a lot faster if I had like a solid sales mentor. Like it was literally yeah. we were, go- were Googling things like when does a lead become an opportunity or like how, yeah. how do you even do sales? Like there was this like, <laughs> I'm trying to remember what it was called. There was like a six page like PDF that I think came from like Harvard Business School or something. Yeah. It was called selling as a systematic process. And it was just like, look, it was Ooh. only six pages. How comprehensive could it have been? But it's like an yeah. overview basically of like, how mm-hmm. you sell. And that was yeah. like my Bible. I was like, oh my God, like this is okay, cool. Like, let's do this. <laughs> yeah. Nah, I'd love to see that PDF actually. I gotta dig that up. I wonder if it still exists. Like, yeah, I want you to email me that because we can put it on the screen in the in the in the YouTube or whatever when we do that. And or hyperlink it and be like, this is how we seem learn sales. I bet, you know, um, the worst part is I think it's probably even like a paywalled thing. And I bet someone like got me a pirated PDF of it or so the whole thing was like extremely <laughs> janky. Like new torrent or whatever. Totally. You know, back it's like look, day, we were yeah. bootstrapped, we were 22, we didn't know anything about anything. The whole thing was extremely scrappy. And I think that actually yeah. also like forced some one, it forced really good hygiene. And two, it forced us to learn a lot about a lot. Because I think like you know, that the venture back started to raise a ton of money out of the gate. Your first instincts are like, cool, I got a bunch of money. Like, let me go hire people to do the things. Whereas for us, mm-hmm. it was like, cool, we don't have any money. I guess I'm doing all the things. And so yeah. I think that kind of forced us to like really dip our toes into a bunch of different aspects of running the business in a way that was ultimately, I think, really helpful. Yeah. Nice. Nice. That's amazing. And for for you, you're, you're still obviously doing founder led sales, probably not as much as you were at the beginning of the company. Right. And so I think that gives you a superpower with being able to understand like, Hey, maybe we don't have as much pipeline as, as we want. Like what, you know how to ask what questions. Totally. Right. Like, and which is super, super duper powerful. And the question I have for you today is like, you know, you are actually, before I ask that question, your service is almost like you mentioned tech enabled, accounting right it's it's almost like that level where it's it's almost like half software half agency uh in a way yes right yeah, yeah and and you know i was talking to him, i had this idea where i think that's where most software companies are going to have to go um i don't know what your thoughts are but i think not, not all of them of course the infrastructure high tech stuff but a lot of them if you look at like an outreach right where we produce this you know this platform to uh, create a bunch of, you know, uh, help with your outbound process, automate emails, calls, all that stuff, right? Well, it wasn't successful without us actually creating the content for the sequences and creating the sequences and the layout. And so we think, uh, you know, I think a lot of us tend to think like, oh, we're a tech company, but there's still that level of services that you need. And it's almost more important because the software means nothing if you can't provide them with the things that they need in order to make the software successful. Um, And that's where professional services comes in and you hear this whole adoption thing. And and how do you get people to adopt? So you have people helping them service them. And so is recently I've kind of shifted my mindset on that where, you know, initially you think, well, how can I just use software to automate this and do everything? And and we're a tech company. We're not a, we're not like a, you know, we're not an agency or whatever. Like how do we get away from like having to throw more bodies at each problem or whatever? And so I'm like, no, maybe I just own that. And like say, no, we, we're going to need to be almost half agency and provide the services, right? Uh, along with what we build. So I'd love to get your whole thoughts around, around that, you know, of like tech enabled versus pure software versus, versus like which direction should people think about and how should they think about, you know, as they build a company like that? Sure. So they have pros and cons. And I have a blog post like on Substack called don't start a tech enabled service, which uh, oh, like, obviously, okay. obviously I'm being a little cute. Like we did start a tech enabled service. I run a tech enabled service. Obviously I think it's a good idea, but yeah, uh, let's yeah. talk briefly about kind of like the pros and cons, the pros and cons, the pro of pure software is yeah. amazing gross margin. The like incremental cost of copy is zero. It's super scalable. Like you can probably run it with a smaller team, small lean team. Like there are so many things to like about building a software product. And in some cases, honestly, if you can do that, that's probably easier slash probably the right answer. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem is usually you can't. And the reason you can't is because people don't want to buy software. People want to buy solutions to their problems. And usually the solution to the problem is, okay, well, I buy this software and then either I or an agency I hire or someone at my company or whatever, like does something with the software to produce the outcome. 
Yeah. And our perspective is like hand wavy, AI, LLM, whatever, like all this stuff means that there are things that used to be pure services businesses that actually can now be kind of like software plus AI plus some people to do that, to kind of serve that same endpoint better, faster, more scalably, more repeatably, et cetera. And there are like interesting economies of scale there. Like a fake example, if I could sell you a software product like Outreach that helps out with like cold outbound stuff, or I was the best agency in the world at just like helping do it for you, and it was not like dramatically more expensive. Yeah, I would rather you solve the problem for me end to end than give me a software tool I have to use myself. So Mm -hmm. that's the pro of the tech-enabled services side of things, which is people actually want their problems solved. They don't want to buy software. The big con is it's operationally a huge pain. Like your gross margins aren't as good because there are humans. It's not as consistent because there are humans. (laughs) Like there's all kinds of, it's just like the matrix of like things that could go wrong or are just harder to imagine, you know, manage expands dramatically because the customer is now not constrained to like the world of your software product. The customer is constrained to literally anything they might ask you to do. And so in theory, you're like tackling a problem of like totally unbounded complexity, which is like, again, if you can do it, it's very powerful. Like you could email your pilot rep or me right now and be like, hey, I have a question about blah, blah, blah. And like, we're going to try to be helpful. We may say, hey, we don't do that. Or we may say, hey, actually, yeah, cool. Like we do. Here's what you should do. But it's like the set of things you might possibly ask us about is like anything you might put in an email as opposed to like in a software product. It's like, look, you can click one of seven buttons and like you're all you're all much more on the rails when you have think of yourself as having bought a software product as opposed yeah. to, oh, I engage with this service to help me with all things accounting. Yeah, that's interesting. And I'm thinking of this through the, the company I'm doing now, which is Distribute, because we essentially have a software to create one pagers for sales teams, right? And you can start with a blank page. And again, it, it reminds me of this because it's a blessing and a curse, right? It's like, you, well, oh, it's like an app store on a page. So you can basically create anything you want. But that means there's so many possibilities right. that people go, well, what do I create? Right? What do I do? And so this is where I'm kind of like, mm, I might have to steal some of pilots like strategy here because I'm like, that's where I do the tech enabled service where I'm almost like an extension for the content team, right? Because I know salespeople need more content. Marketing's underwater, right? So how do we basically provide them a service? Like we get more content out that converts, but also use the, the tech with, you know, having someone create the, con- you know, maybe a writer or a designer or whatever it may be. Yeah. And so that's kind of what I'm thinking, right? Um, and that may make more sense versus just like, here's the software, have at it. Hopefully you're creative enough to come up with something. Right. <laughs> right. Know? I mean, that's, that's kind of like that, that blank page problem, which is like the implementation, getting people to actually implement it, getting people to actually use it, getting people to get ROI from it. It is much harder than just like getting them to buy the tool. Yeah. Yeah. And, and for you, you know, you mentioned tech enabled and, is your goal like long-term vision to keep it tech enabled or, or, or are you like go, trying to go all AI eventually? Like now that you started tech enabled, are you moving towards like going all AI or are you kind of like, no, we're going to stay tech enabled as, as we move forward? My perspective is basically that like, what are you buying when you buy pilot? It's the peace of mind of knowing that someone like smart and competent is on the other end and is basically on your team. Yeah. And that suggests to me that even if the computer could do 100% of the work, and I don't think the computer can do 100% of the work anytime soon, but even yeah. if the computer could do 100% of the work, you would still want the person there. You'd want the person there to, one, manage the relationship, two, to like help out on weird escalations and stuff. And three, I think if we, if we like fully solve accounting or whatever, which again, I don't think we will anytime soon, the natural next step for us is not to be like, okay, we're done. Like, let's all go home and the AI will just do it. It's we should do even more for you. Like, should we do HR? Should we do IT? Should we do mm. recruiting? Should we do yeah. you know, help you with business insurance? Like, we should just like, ultimately the vision for us is, listen, if I could be your person who just like did all your back office stuff and you could focus all of your time on like the core thesis and mission of the business, that would be super powerful. And so I know, like, I think for us, one, that requires a human in the loop. And two, it requires a particular type of human, meaning it requires actually like an expensive, highly skilled, smart, 
talented person. It's not just like commodity labor. So I think yeah. as the computer does more and more, the human and the, the caliber of the human element actually in some ways will become increasingly important because we would we will be asking them to do just the like trickiest, hardest, most important stuff. Ah, uh, got it, got it. Interesting. So it, as the technology improves, so does almost the level of intelligence of the human, let's call it, or the, the ability for them to execute in, in, in problem solve, right? Totally. It, <laughs> in some ways, it's kind of like the airline pilot. Like the plane mostly flies itself. Autopilot yeah, is yeah. very good. But yeah. the reason you want like <laughs> talented, seasoned pilots who have tons of flight hours, who have tons of training, is like sometimes stuff goes wrong. And when that yeah. stuff goes wrong, you want like the A plus team flying the plane. Yeah. And again, that's not where we are today. The hum the like the talented team at pilot who are all full time employees of ours, who are US based. It's just like an amazing crew. This uh, there's a lot that we do by hand. It's not like the computer is just beep, beep, boop, boop doing everything. Um yeah. but even if it were. Like, if anything, I think that increases the need to have like a really talented team of folks backing it up rather than kind of alleviating it. Yeah. Wow. And, and you, um, I, I want to switch gears a little bit here because we, we're, we're talking about pilot and going all the way. And I can see your vision now. You're going to, you're starting with accounting and then you're going to go, you're thinking HR, you're thinking recruiting, right? All those services. You're almost going to be like the one stop shop for like a lot of these departments almost. Totally. But yeah. Which is awesome. And you had this, this, this is actually how I first learned about you. I think it was in, yeah, it was October of last year. And it was a tweet you wrote, which was, I sold my first startup to Oracle. I sold my second startup to Dropbox. Pilot is a unicorn backed by Jeff Bezos and is my third and final startup. If it weren't, the fourth company would be five engineers, no venture capital, and we all sit in a room together. <laughs> so one, I was like, oh my God, this is a great flex. Uh, this guy is a, a badass. Um, and then two, I was like, I wonder what he means by this. Uh, right. Like what, like obviously everything he, there's so many questions I have just with this tweet. And I think that's why I did so well. Sure. Right. The first question I have is why is it your final startup? Like, because you could probably keep going and going and going and going. I don't know. Maybe you want to like become, you know, like travel the world or something, but like, where's your head at with that? And, and why did you decide this is going to be your final one? Yeah. The way I think about this is basically like, I think we have all the elements for this, meaning we have an amazing team. The business is well capitalized. It has great traction. And as we just talked about the like scope of the vision is so large that I'm, I'm positive you could spend like multiple decades working on this like the scope of what we're trying to do is so big and to some extent it's like look if we're ever going to build an iconic enduring public company like this is our shot at it so yeah. like for me it's like why would i want to do a fourth company like anything i could achieve in a fourth company i could achieve here probably at even greater scale so there's some yeah. some amount of like all the elements are here. Like if we're going to do it big, this is the chance to do it big. And yeah. if we're not going to do it big, like for whatever reason, or if I decide I'm done, other people are going to carry the torch or whatever. It's not be going to be because I like want to go try again. It's like, this is yeah. kind of like, I think in, in many ways, like the final project. And now again, it could be a multi-decade project. I'm not, I don't have particular views on how long it ends up being. Yeah. I just am very, very skeptical that it makes sense to start over. Like there's so much we already have going for us here for me personally that it's like it, this is much more interesting a platform to like build and do than anything I think I could start again. Got it. And so, you know, some people would look at this and say, oh, he, he just probably has a shit ton of money. You know, no, like, I he's wish. Just, like he's over it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. It's maybe. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. 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 He's over it. You know, it like depends on how, like, how good the IPO is, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. He's over, you know, he's going to have enough money, you know, like whatever. But no, for you, it's just like you see the vision. Um, and what I see in you saying that is you also thinking long term about the company, right? Not like when's our next exit going to be or how fast are we going to get to this and like, um, it's more of like, no, like this thing has potential to do many other things and, and we can go along for that ride. Well, in, um, in particular, just like a quick aside on this is like people think there's like an end to the game or there's like a finish line that you get to. And like, there kind of really isn't like, there's always more to do. 
Mm-hmm. And so to some extent, like if you're like, well, I'm going to just like play the game until I've beaten the game. Like you don't actually beat the, even like the IPO, the I, people talk about this all the time. They say like, look, the IPO is not the end. The IPO is the beginning. There's mm-hmm. like, and if you look at like Amazon or whatever, some of these really iconic and during companies, 99% of the value creation is post IPO. Yeah. So it's like, I just don't think you're ever done. And if you're never done, you kind of have to proactively decide to keep playing the game. And you need to be playing the game because you enjoy the journey, not because like you're trying to get to a particular milestone. I think trying to get to a particular milestone is in some ways a recipe for like being pretty unhappy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Just to get to a milestone. And you said your pilot is backed by Jeff, Jeff Bezos. So how, how did how'd that come to be? Obviously, I'm sure a lot of people ask you about that. Um, you know, maybe you're working out in the gym with him or something, you know, cause he's super jacked now. Sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but how did that come to be? I, I'm curious. Pretty randomly, pretty randomly, which is yeah. <clears throat> when we raised our series C, which Sequoia and whale rock and some other folks participated in, as we were kind of filling out the round, one of our investors said, Oh, you know, this is the kind of thing that like Jeff Bezos's family office might be very interested in. Like, do you want to talk to them about it? And I was like, sure. And you don't, you don't talk to Jeff Bezos, but like he has a person who like, you know, manages this stuff for him and like you talk to them and they were awesome and very like kind and smart. And apparently what happens is they write up, they write up like an Amazon style memo. And then just like one morning, it's like on Jeff's desk. I imagine he's like sipping his coffee and he reads and he's like, yeah, let's do it. And then they do it. (laughs) That's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, you know, reading his coffee, doing his thing, and then, oh, yeah, who's this pilot thing? Yeah, I think he probably uh, just has like a stack of stuff. He's like, oh, let me take a look at this. Yeah, check yeah, out. Like, let's, yeah. let's, let's, let's get involved. It's like, okay, that's, that's cool. That's awesome. Yeah, that's getting in. And um, Jeff, good old Jeff, huh? Um, chilling on the yacht now. Indeed. I think he's doing like SpaceX, or not SpaceX, at Oregon. Yeah, Blue Origin. Blue Origin. Yeah. Blue Origin. All right, next point in this tweet, which is also, we're breaking down the tweet. If it weren't, the fourth company would be five engineers on venture capital. We all sit in a room together. Okay, let, let's let's hear your thought process on this one. Okay, so obviously this is a troll a little bit, but I think there's actually yeah. like real insight here, which is two 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 nuggets in this one. Nugget yeah. one is people are obsessed with venture capital. Like people fetishize it. They think like, oh, if you've raised mm-hmm. VC, you're awesome. Like, how much should you raise? Oh, that's like how good a person you are, or whatever. And it's like, look, there's more than one way to finance a company. VC has a lot of pros, but it also has a lot of cons. Yeah. And I think that like people do not, people just seem to switch off their brains when they like think about venture capital. They're like, yeah, it's good. Do it. And I think actually like it depends on what you want and it depends on what you're trying to build and it depends on what you're trying to achieve. Like we bootstrapped the first company. We didn't raise any VC. As it turns out, we probably couldn't have, but we, we didn't, we didn't raise any VC. We started a company in 2008. It was like dire economic times. Yeah. You know, if we wanted to spend more, we had to make more revenue by selling our thing to customers. And that was like good and healthy. And it forced a certain amount of discipline and it forced a certain amount of like forced, you know, real contact with reality. And I think startups in this current crop are like waking up to that again, which is the way you build a successful business is you have a thing that people like and they want to give you money for. And in some ways, VC is a cheat code to avoid having to do that temporarily. You can't, he's not going to avoid it forever, but it allows you to like forget about that constraint for a little bit. Yeah. Under the theory that it allows you to go faster and build bigger. Like there are obviously lots of good things about VC. We raised VC in our second company. We raised VC in this third company. Clearly I'm like also pro the VC path. Yeah. But it's not the only way to do it. And I think it's important to say out loud that's not the only way to do it. The second part of that thing is it would be five people in a room together. One of the things that I think people don't appreciate, and this is not like boohoo, my job is hard or whatever. Like I love my job, but the job of like being the CEO of a multi hundred person company is very different than like the early days when you're starting the thing. And mm-hmm. most people I think start the thing. Well, most people like us maybe because they're builders and they mm-hmm. want to make a thing and they enjoy the craft of making the thing. And like for you and me, that's probably like actually like writing those first few lines of code, like having those Mm -hmm. first few customer conversations, like getting that first MVP into someone's hand. You're like, you're there and you're like actively doing the work. And there's something that's so satisfying about that. Now, the problem is like when you're CEO of a, you know, multi hundred or multi thousand person company, your, your job is rarely do the work. 
your job is like build the organization capable of doing the work and hire and retain the best people and like give them good tra- career trajectories and all that stuff. And like that is interesting work, but it's different work. Like I don't mm-hmm. write any code these days and like mm-hmm. I kind of miss that. I'm not on tons of customer calls these days. I'm on a, f- a fair bit because as we just talked about, I like like to stay super close to it, but yeah, not yeah. nearly as many as I was in the early days. In the early days, I sold the first 100 accounts myself. Like I was on the mm-hmm. phones all the time. Um, yeah. And so I think it's important to like introspect on like what actually brings you joy and how do you make sure that the way you're spending your time like mostly involves that. Mm-hmm. And I think there is an alternate reality where actually, and this is related to not raising a VC, there's yeah. an alternate reality where you bootstrap the thing, you keep it super small, and you're laser focused on the actual doing of the work because that's like what brings you joy. Yeah. That's that's the claim of this tweet. Is like if there was an alternate universe where I was not doing what I'm doing now, and to be clear, I really like what I'm doing now, the alternate universe is that. It's not trade pilot to do a startup for that is shaped like pilot. It would be trade yeah. pilot to like be a hacker again. You know, it's like to be in the yeah. room with the engineers, like right in the code. Yeah, that and there, there's a beauty to that. Totally. Right? There really is. There's such a beauty to to like sitting down and doing the work. Right. And like um, builders like it. You know, and, and it, it, it's kind of a curse sometimes because sometimes, as you mentioned, this is the problem I have. I always think I can do everything, right? And and I know though, like, you know, my wife's great at telling us like, hey, you know you can do that, but you probably shouldn't because you got to focus on yes. the sale right, yes. right now. Like, you know you could get in there and build this thing because you know it needs to get done, but don't do it. Let the team do it and you focus on the sales. And I'm like, shit, yes. you're so right, you know? And so my question to you is like, when did, when did you flip the switch, right? Of like, okay, and maybe it was gradual. I don't know. But when did you flip the switch where it's like, okay, I'm doing everything I can right now to, okay, now I'm backing up and I'm going to, my focus is recruiting and putting people to do the things. Like when was that? Totally. And one clarification, yeah. which is, look, we talked about this in the context of like writing the code or whatever, yeah. but it's equally true for the seller. Like you're going to be tempted to just like, well, again, let me just like sell the next hundred accounts because I'm like good at it and I'm passionate about it and customers like talking yeah. about whatever. But actually, no, the work to scale is like, okay, how do I build the sales work? And again, that's very different work than the work of doing the selling. So I think yeah. it like almost doesn't even like for the builder or the seller, I think this dilemma in some ways is there. It's true for both. Now to yeah. your question is like, when do you shift gears? Well, I think for me, it's, it's probably about like, and for me, it was actually, uh, you know, at this company, I was principally on the sales side. Like I didn't write any code of pilot. Yeah. For me, it was like, okay, do I feel like the sales process is systematic and repeatable enough that I could train someone to do it? And do I feel like I'm a bottleneck on the process? Like, are we selling, are we not selling as much because I'm not able, like we are not able to give every prospect as much love as they should be getting because like we don't have enough staffing working on it. Those are mm. the two things I would look for. It's like, okay, cool. We've got the phone ringing a ton we're not actually able to like give them the love they should be getting because like I don't have time to answer all these calls. And we feel like we actually understand how to sell it, who we're trying to sell it to, like what resonates, et cetera. When those are true, that's a signal to me that like, oh, okay, y- yeah, we are, we're overdue actually for having like scaled this up a little bit. Like my job is now build the machine capable of doing it. It's not continue mm-hmm. to do it. Got it. So long story short, it's when you start to feel like you're a bottleneck in the process and that's when you're like okay we've now i'm out i need to get someone to do it because you know i'm feeling this right now in some scenarios where it's like we're creating templates in the platform and and i'm holding up the designer you know because i like need to get back to it totally shit maybe you know and you feel that and you're like well i'm the issue now (laughs) i'm the problem me i'm the problem um and so it's interesting you kind of gotta i feel like get rid of your ego a little bit on that too right because there's like there's this feeling of like, no one's going to do it as good as I do because this is my baby. Yes. Right? Yes. You're right? And that may be true, by the way, but it almost doesn't matter. Whether it's true or not, yeah. you cannot continue to do it because you're a bottleneck. And even if the person who's going to do it in your stead will do it at 90% the quality you're going to do it, it's still the right decision for the business. But yes, it's hard to let go because like, you know how to do it, you do it well, and you know what? You like to do things that you do well. And this yeah. new thing is a thing you haven't done before, maybe, 
and therefore is a thing that you're probably not going to do very well because you've never done it before. And like, of course, you'd rather work on the like thing you're good at. It's much more fun to work on the thing you're good at than the thing you're bad at. But unfortunately, yeah. as the company scales, your job is basically continuously doing things you're bad at that are new to you that you haven't mastered. Because if you have mastered them, it's probably time to like hand it off to someone else and like tackle the next even bigger problem for the business. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I like that. And it's also too, um, you know, like on another podcast, you mentioned um, hiring a salesperson and, and you were like, well, when should you hire a salesperson? People's first instinct is, well, we have the product. Let's get someone to go and sell it. Right. But there's that issue that can occur of, well, what if this thing's not the right thing we're selling or people aren't going to buy it? Then, then you have an issue with the salesperson and yourself and you might do it too early. And this is good feedback that you sold the first hundred accounts. Right. And how long did that take you to do with seeing? I don't remember, but I feel like I was like the sales rep for the first year of the company, at least. First year. And then okay. like when we had the first sales hire, this woman named Kate, who was awesome. Like she and I did a bunch of it together. It's not like I was like, cool, nice. over to you. Like, no, it's still like, it, look, I'm still in the mix. You know, now seven plus years in, I'm like still on sales calls. Like right after this, we're doing a sales, I'm doing a sales call with one of our reps. Um, but it's, you know, it's not like you just like hand it off and you're done. You're still involved. Just hopefully you, you're starting to build a process and a playbook to do the work well at scale. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And we'll wrap it up here. I know we had 45 minutes. So a couple of questions I have for you, which is one, people love this question. It's very basic. Best business book that everyone should read. What, what is that? Well, we're kind of like thinking about sales on this, in the, on this pod. Yeah, There's a book called podcast. Founding Sales by Pete Kazanji. It's actually free online. In a, you can also get it on Amazon or whatever. I actually oh, think it's man, yeah. super good. Like, I think it's a, it's so tactical. And I think that's what, especially if you're like, if you don't have a sales background and you're a founder, you like want to learn how to do sales. I really, really like founding sales. Yeah. Well, I, what was more impressive about that, that book you recommend is how you know how to pronounce Pete's last name. <laughs> Cause I never know. How to do it. <laughs> well, I'm not hundred percent sure I got it right, but I, yeah. hopefully he'll call me if I got it wrong. <laughs> yeah. PK, you know, yeah, PK, PK. <laughs> PK, you know, PK. All right. Best purchase you've made under a hundred bucks recently. This is like, okay. It, it's like a little earplug thing. It's called like loop engage or whatever. It's like a silicone earplug. And the huh. idea is that like they built this thing for like you're going to a concert. It's like too loud, but you still want to like hear the music. You put this thing in and it just like makes the world a little quieter. And I actually like like if I'm like on public transit or somewhere noisy, just like having the world be like a tiny bit quieter is like surprisingly like soothing. Very interesting. <laughs> Loop engage. Okay. I think that's what it's called. It's just like you'll find it if you Google that thing. It's basically like a silicone reusable earplug that is like subtle. It looks like, you know, it does not look like you have a big foam earplug in your ear or whatever. Interesting. Okay. I want to, how did you discover that? You heard on a podcast or something? What was the, this is, this is maybe embarrassing. I have a three year old <laughs> when he was like much younger, all babies cry, obviously. And you're yeah. holding the baby like right here and they're crying directly into your ear and it's super loud. Like yeah. you still want to be able to yeah. hear the fact that the baby is crying, but maybe you don't need to hear it at 120 decibels. Like yeah. having a little bit of just like sound attenuation, I found like decreased my stress, like by a factor of two, I could just like much more easily manage like, okay, you are crying. Let me figure out how to get you to stop crying. As opposed yeah. to like when it was at full volume, my brain was like, boop, boop, you know, it's just like, <laughs> yeah. it's like, it reminds me of that situation where you're driving and like, you have to like really drive intensely and you turn the music down. Cause you're like, all right, this, I'm going to be a better driver. Totally. Now. You know, <laughs> I feel like, yeah, your brain, like if you can shut off some of the inputs, it like lets your brain focus on the other inputs. Yeah. And you know, what's so funny is I have that same story. I have an 18 month old right now and I would put in earplugs, right? But they were light ones. And so there wasn't the same one, but and my wife would be like, wait, you're not going to like wake up. You're putting earplugs. I'm like, no, I can still hear the baby. Yeah, I'll crying. definitely still wake up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm definitely still going to wake up, but it's just not going to be like, you know, like, it's just going to be, oh, okay, I'll get up and do the thing and, right. you know, make it happen. Yeah. So that's so funny. That is exactly what I did too. Um, but we'll see. This has been great, my friend. Uh, thanks for hopping on. Um, love it. People can find you if they want to. You respond to emails. So if y'all have questions on Pilot or anything, we'll see him at pilot.com, I think. It yeah, is, we'll see right? pilot.com. Check out my Substack. We'll see him.substack.com. Follow me yeah. on LinkedIn. Follow me on Twitter. 
yeah. Uh, yeah thanks for having me on this was really fun uh glad glad to do it yeah this is amazing thank you my friend thank uh, you appreciate it